in audacity in three two one Hi, guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Barbell Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Lynn, and I'm here with my co-host, Marissa Roy. And in today's episode, we are going to talk about non-evidence-based coaching practices that yes. we have kind of throughout our years have seen. So it's going to be a very interesting conversation because we have, I guess we kind of preach that we are evidence-based coaches. Yeah. So this will be a fun one. Yeah. So hopefully the clickbait got you and glad you're here. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, no, I, I actually stole this idea. So this is not an original idea for a podcast. Hmm. I I loved it so much. And I know that we could obviously put our own take and spin on it, but I've been on a big Cody McBroom tailored life podcast kick. Um, Love his stuff. Uh, I think I've said that before, but uh, either way, he did kind of an interview on another podcast that he posted. Um, and it was about this topic. Like what are some mm-hmm. ways that you coach that maybe aren't fully supported by the evidence, but you know, work either from anecdotal evidence, or maybe there's just not research about it, or maybe the research says something completely opposite, but with a particular person and particular circumstance, this could work for that person. Right. And so we're not just going to tell you today that keto actually is great. Uh, mm-hmm. we're going to, uh, it's kind of more nuanced, but I'm really excited about it because I think it's really important to give a nod to anecdotal practices, as well as understanding the fact that evidence is very important, but evidence-based is actually, um, more multifaceted than a lot of people think. A lot of people think evidence-based equals what does the research paper say is optimal, but in fact, it is the, the combination of what does the research say is optimal and what is the, um, coach's actual experience in that realm. And also what is the client's preference needs and wants and the marriage between all of that is what's truly evidence-based. And so, I don't even know if we can say this is not evidence-based, but um, how do we use those maybe things that aren't as much in the research that we still know work for people? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited. So you have on our outline that you want to do some short life updates. So I think uh, you had something pretty big happen, (laughs) something small. I don't know if you want to talk about it. (laughs) So, well, actually I wrote this outline like a couple months ago for this episode. Um, so I don't know what the heck was going on in our lives at the point in time where I wrote that, but you know, timing works out because this is our first, um, episode we're recording where I'm married, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I got married on August 21st, uh, to Aaron. If you are new here, my now husband, still weird to say, um, on Sunday and Christina was not this Sunday, but two Sundays ago and Christina was there and it was a jolly old time and it was awesome <laughs> to have you. <laughs> awesome have jolly you old time. <laughs> it was super um, jolly. <laughs> no, it was really, it was honestly like an amazing day, an amazing weekend. Um, and I finally understand why people like look back on the wedding day and they're like, um, oh, I have to tell you something, but, um, they look back on their wedding day. They're like, that was the best day ever. Or like all of that. And I tell you, and I'll tell you this on air too, because he, he didn't want me to tell you that he admitted this, but we were sitting at the reception after like all the dances and all of the like speeches and stuff. We're sitting there and everybody's getting up to get food um, at the buffet line. And something that Christina has always said that has always kind of struck me and definitely Aaron is as very strange and very like girl of you is that you want to get married again like get a divorce with your husband just to get married to him again and um he sits there and he looks at me and he goes I finally understand why Christy we were like oh uh you know the day went by so fast it's almost over oh my god I'm so sad this has been such an amazing day and he goes man I really understand why Christina wants to get married again and he was like, don't tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's it's like the best. It's just the best day ever. And I think what you were kind of saying the entire weekend was it's like, it's really fun to see everyone from all these different areas of your life. Like you have fitness yeah. and you have your team and, you know, you have family and you have friends from different areas and have everyone in the same room there for you and Aaron to celebrate your relationship is so special. And I, you know, we were talking and it's like show day on steroids. 
Um, cause that's one of my favorite aspects of show day is just like feeling like I have all this support and love, um, you know, throwing in some good food. That's, that's a bonus, but, um, mm-hmm. it's, it's that support that I really enjoy the most. Yeah, that's, that's definitely what it was. Um, cause when I think about, you know, what makes it special. Yeah. The venue was beautiful. Yeah. It was all great. And, um, uh, we made the ceremony super fun. If you didn't know, um, we, after the ceremony and, you know, you may kiss the bride and all that, we got confetti cannons and we exited to the song death of a bachelor by panic at the disco. Um, and when the music dropped into the chorus, we exploded our cannons and it was awesome. And it was my Mm -hmm. idea. Um, (laughs) but, uh, no, it was great. And so all of those things to say the most memorable part of all of it was definitely just having everybody there. Um, kind of surreal kind of weird like people like from all different separate areas of your life like crossing over and meeting each other like that was definitely like strange almost but also very very cool um to have like us being the uniting factor amongst all those people so yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we definitely want to get to, div- well, I, I want to get divorced. My husband is- <laughs> he thinks I'm crazy, <laughs> but, um, we've, we've settled on a vow renewal and I was poo pooed at, uh, five years. He didn't think that was a cool enough number. So <laughs> we have surpassed five years. So I have to wait until 10. <laughs> you can do like seven. I know. I, yeah, maybe we'll see. I'll probably be pregnant <laughs> <laughs> with like, child number like three at that point but oh my god uh, I know (laughs) um but giving birth is something that I wouldn't want to do over again (laughs) yeah but like the immediate aftermath I would that like that's another day I I would do over and over again yeah um but I'm glad that you understand my crazy now yeah mostly yeah. <laughs> um, so let's dive on in. I don't really have any updates other than I went to North Carolina and now I'm home. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we'll have to have you out again because I don't think you were able to actually come to our house at all. Right. No, no, I wasn't. So I got in, uh, my flight was delayed getting in on Saturday and I'm glad that I gave myself a buffer. I mean, I was there, I felt like for such a short amount of time, but like yeah. traveling from the West coast to the East coast just is an entire day of travel. Um, and I didn't want to be away from Colton for too long. Cause I actually didn't have that large of a milk stash. It feels like you do. Cause you have all these like frozen milk bags. Um, but at one point my husband's like, yeah, we're good. But I just wanted to have a buffer, um, because, exactly what I thought would happen is my flight, my connecting flight home was canceled. Um, Mm -hmm. so I had to stay overnight in Houston and luckily my cousin lives there. So it actually worked out really, really nice. I was able to spend time with her, um, and meet her two kiddos that I had not met yet. Um, and see her oldest one that had grown up. And so I hadn't seen him since he was like under a year and he's like five years old now, which was crazy. Yeah. Um, and this is the cousin that I'm working with now. So it was, it was really nice. Um, Oh, cool. Yeah. So, um, but I'm glad that I had that buffer in because if I had extended and something else had happened, we probably wouldn't have had enough milk. So yeah. Fun fact. Yeah. I saw that and I was like, Oh shit. Like, (laughs) yeah, but everything ended up working out great, but, uh, let's kind of dive on into today's topic. Yeah. Cool. So we kind of have just like a list of different things of like non-evidence-based ways that we coach. And so I think probably how we'll want to approach this is, you know, of course we've been aiming for the shorter episodes, so not spending too long on each one, but probably what does the research actually say about the topic and, um, how does this kind of go against it or how is it not supported and why it actually anecdotally works for certain people or for clients. So I guess first, these are all really good. Um, (laughs) but I will say, um, one that I really like talking about is just with protein intake. It's a very, very common topic uh, that we talk about here and online and all of that. Um, And one thing that we do, and I'm sure you do the same thing is 
we start our clients out with data collection. So when they start working with us immediately, we have them track what they're eating so that we know what the heck are you putting into your body right now, whether or not we move forward tracking after that, regardless of that, we just need to know what your freaking baseline is. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we have our clients do that for anywhere from five to seven days. Um, and usually, uh, if somebody doesn't have a background in like being coached and health and fitness, they are usually severely under eating protein by like, you know, uh, 30 to 50 grams per day, um, in total. And it is wildly low compared to what we need, which is closer to 0.8 to 1.2 pounds uh, grams per pound body weight per day. So if I'm 150 pounds, that's crazy anywhere around 150 grams per day, right? So 30 to 50 grams, not cutting it. Something that we do is we will start our clients out with a more realistic protein goal to start. Um, because even if it's not optimal, right? Like we could, this is a mistake I've made in the past. I would get a client, they'd be severely under eating pretty much everything. And I'd be like, great, you need 130 grams of protein a day. And they'd be like, um, holy shit, I am so full. This sucks. I can't do this. I'm a failure and I'm going to go cry in a hole now. Um, and so instead what we lean towards doing is, starting with, um, either like a goal that's more realistic. So if that person averaged 50 grams a day, maybe we start with 75 as the target and yeah, it's still too low and it's not supported by the evidence of benefiting their goals, but it's a step in the right direction towards that quote unquote optimal. And even if they never get to what's optimal, like maybe they need 150 and they only ever get up to 110. A lot of times we will just prioritize, um, consistent over optimal. So if they're eating three hearty servings of protein per day, and they're getting up to 110 and it's not perfect, but they do that pretty consistently compared to hit or miss and feeling defeated with a goal of 150. Um, that to me is much more of a win for not only their consistency overall, but also like their ability to, um, stimulate muscle protein synthesis across the day because they're having feedings across the day rather than like trying to chug eight scoops of protein down in the sitting. (laughs) Same. (laughs) I have have nothing to add. We do the exact same thing. And I think again, it just how our coaching styles have evolved over the years do the exact same thing. Like, okay, you're eating 50. Well, I need you to hit 130 or whatever it might be and watching them struggle. And then try to give them all these suggestions for what is going to help, what's going to improve Mm -hmm. rather than just saying, okay, well, let's hit this, but great. You hit this, like what, you know, it probably won't be that much harder to add in another 10 to 15 grams and let's see what happens. And, um, I just actually had a conversation with a client, um, a couple of days ago where she reached out to me and was like, Hey, can I keep my macros the same? She was like, I know that you probably want to increase them. And she's like, but I would really like another week so I can like get better at this set and hit this and feel more comfortable before you make another adjustment. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I do the exact same thing. Love it. Want to take us on to the next one? Yeah. So there, like you said, there, there are a lot of different things. And and I think we've talked about this before with like diet breaks and refeeds Mm -hmm. and, while, and you know, we just had, um, uh, oh my gosh, who grant, um, uh, what right? for refeeds? Eric? Yeah. It, was it Eric comes? Eric. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was grant. Uh, but yeah, Eric comes. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, one the of the, not our number one best. Yeah. Podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Bearcat's better. Uh, but no, <laughs> um, but the, the refeeds, it's like, you know, the evidence will say that, you know, two consecutive day refeeds, uh, or a week long diet break, like those are the most optimal. If you want to take time, uh, away from, from dieting for, uh, increasing your, um, you know, leptin and reducing cortisol and things like that. And that's all great. And that's what the research says, but I have implemented refeeds with clients before and they don't like them. They just don't 
they don't like seeing the scale spike, even if it comes back way lower and they hit a new low two or three days later, they just cannot mentally handle seeing the scale spike, you know, a pound or two the next day. And so they almost like dread the refeeds. Um, and I know that you and I are the exact same way because I remember these conversations very vividly when you and I were going through contest prep. And I like, I, I specifically remember my coach emailing me and being like, Hey, I think this is a really good time for a diet break. And I was like, what? Cause I literally told him like, I'm ready to dig, like, let me eat dirt. <laughs> like I want to <laughs> do it, like increase my cardio, like let's do it. And he did the exact opposite. And I felt like a failure. I felt like I'm not making enough progress. We've stalled. So we have to have this diet break. And that was really mentally tough for me. Um, and I, you know, of course it's like after, you know, a day or two eating more food, you're like, oh, okay, this is, this I is actually, like carbs. Kinda, <laughs> yeah, this is actually kind of nice. Um, but still like you have to take into consideration, like we, you know, this whole podcast is it's like, even though it's optimal, like what is that individual client? How are they responding? And if they're, if they don't like it, then it doesn't really make sense to continue to do what's optimal. Um, based on the research. So there are clients where I think that we could carb cycle, but they just want to keep everything consistent day to day. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that's kind of how I feel with, with briefings and diet breaks is I'll throw them in, see how a client responds and if they like them great, but if they don't, then they're not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. And like on the flip side of that too, you know, there's research that says, um, repeats diet breaks, they benefit muscle retention and all these hormones and things. And then there was that research review where someone picked it apart and was like, "Mm, actually it's Mm -hmm. not muscle retention. It's water because of the body fat scanner. And it's just because you're eating more carbs that it shows up as muscle on the scan. So how do we know that refeeds are actually beneficial? And that caused this whole like uprooting of, you know, everybody's like, oh my God, the research about it's all futile. Don't use diet breaks and blah, blah, blah. But it never got that far because so much of the evidence-based community was like, well, we still really like these because Mm -hmm. on the flip side, there's people that live for their diet breaks and refeeds. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of those where I'm like, that Mm -hmm. high carb day is the only thing getting me to Saturday. Like, yeah, yeah, that's how I was. And that's really down to like the psychology of it. There may be research on it at this point, but all of this research on refeeds and diet breaks is so new. Like literally 2019 was like the most, like the first one that was like properly done. So um, there's not a lot. And so we haven't delved completely into behavioral psychology around how does, uh, you know, intermittent diet strategies actually promote better adherence and sticking to the plan for longer because we have these breaks in between and we have these high carb days. We have more flexibility on the weekends. So all this stuff that's not supported by the studies, but supported by people just enjoy having more flexibility a couple of times a week instead of a straight deficit for the most part. But then there's usually people on the other side who are like, that seems like a lot of work and planning and you know, stress for what I am already comfortable in my deficit or whatever it is. So, um, it's very, very individual, but, you know, utilization of refeeds and diet breaks is a really big one that can be coined as evidence-based or not, uh, because it's literally like the fringe of research right now. Yeah. And I'll, I'll kind of say the same thing with like cheat meals too. And so I know that you feel the exact same way as me. Like we don't like using that phrase. Um, we tend to just say, uh, like take an untracked meal because I feel like the connotation of cheat meal is like, oh, you are cheating on your diet so you can have this crazy meal and then, okay, well it's back on track, like after this meal. So you try to cram in everything. Whereas it's just like, Hey, just take a day and, or take a meal and just not track everything and then get back on track. Um, so I have implemented these sometimes with clients, but if clients start to feel like they are, like we were just saying there, they they go crazy during these meals. It's like, okay, well, you know, let's take them out. Whereas other people, it's the same thing. It's like, they look forward to them that they feel like they can be way more adherent throughout the week. And they like the idea of like, okay, well, I can be quote unquote, I don't want to say good, but just consistent during the week. And then they have this opportunity to let loose a little bit. They don't have to worry about tracking that they're still prioritizing protein. Like they're doing all the healthy habits. And then they have something that they feel like is like 
satisfying and then they move on. And um, so I definitely still, I, I utilize those with, with certain clients. And it, again, it all depends on where that client is, what their goals are and how I think that they can handle something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I love it. I feel like we did that justice. Yeah. What would you like to cover next? Mm, I'm going to cover training to failure because, Mm -hmm. um, this is one where there was, and when I was like, I'm not really super, super deep in like the research reviews right now. It's something that I'm working my way back into, but I literally just spent like a year of my life, basically like crash coursing myself on business. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm kind of like swaying back, like, yes, I'm still working on the business. And uh, unfortunately, most of my time is dedicated on Facebook ads, (laughs) but, um, at the same time, uh, I, I do want to make a shift back into like reading those research reviews and just being more up to date with things because a year, literally just a year of kind of being a little bit more removed from that. Uh, Like my ego is hurt because I feel stupid sometimes, but also (laughs) like (laughs) being able to talk about this stuff and like bringing it up, like quick recall about these things and what's new and what the research is now saying, like I'm a year behind basically. So, and I'm just going based on what I'm hearing in like some podcasts rather than like actually looking at it myself. But there was a lot of conversation about training to failure in like 2019, 2020 through the evidence-based community, like so much where I honestly got tired of episodes about (laughs) podcast episodes and research reviews about what should we do? How close to failure should we train? And, um, you know, what constitutes, um, progress in the gym. And the biggest thing that I would say is not evidence-based Based on all that, the research generally now says we want to keep a uh, proximity from failure um, of about, you know, anywhere from two to five to seven reps from failure. And this is quantified with either the um, the RPE scale or the RIR scale. So RPE is rep, uh, rate of perceived exertion, which is used in both cardiovascular and resistance training um, exertion scales and then RIRs reps in reserves. That's strictly for like lifting, powerlifting, lifting weights. And basically it's ways to quantify if you were to literally go until the point where your muscles gave out, or you completely failed, like what, how many reps away from that? Are you reps in reserve is, you know, two reps in reserve is you have two left. Um, RPE is kind of the inverse of that. So an RPE eight would insinuate that you have two reps left in your tank. Um, and so I'm going to speak in terms of RIR if I refer back to it, because it's just simpler to quant- to like conceptualize. But um, a lot of the research basically says you should not train completely to failure because what it's shown, and if you do this in the gym, you can literally test it out for yourself. If you do a set of pull-ups or you do a set of rows or you do a set of squats and you go to failure on your first set, and then you try to go to failure again for two or three more sets, what's going to happen is you're going to have a ton of reps on the first one. And you're going to be totally gassed. And when you go back for the second set, even if you wait like five, 10 minutes, you're still going to have a significant decrease in the number of reps that you're going to be able to do. And the next set again and again, and it's a huge downward slope of the number of reps, total work that you can perform. And usually if you do a couple sets shy of failure, say you leave two or three reps left in the tank you actually don't gas out like your entire system and you're able to consistently perform that same number of reps or more um, as the sets progress. And overall, that means doing more work over the course of the exercise or the workout, getting more overall volume under your belt and um, being able to progress faster in the gym with your strength, your muscle, et cetera. Now, the reason why sometimes I will say, hey, you, Sally, you should train to failure is because women in particular, um, but people in general have a really shitty concept of what failure actually is until they've done it. And so if I have somebody that has literally never gone in the gym, I'm going to give them a safe movement. I'm going to say, uh, cable lat pull downs or rows or bicep curls or something where like, they can't like completely like F up their body (laughs) going to failure, right? I'm not going to give them a deadlift. I'm not going to give them a a barbell squat. 
but I'm going to say, I want you to go to failure until literally your muscles give out and you know, you lose control of your muscles or like you just cannot pull the damn thing or push the damn thing. And what this will show them is whatever weight they picked, they thought they were two reps shy of failure for, uh, it's not the case. (laughs) And they, uh, usually when they've tested this in the research, they've shown that when people are like told to stay two reps shy of failure, they will do so. And then they'll do another set later and they'll be like, okay, now go to failure. And with that same weight, what they thought they were two reps shy, they'll do like 10 extra reps on average, like on average, meaning some people will do 20 extra reps because they are literally that far off with their internal calibration of what failure is like, that's huge. And so when we talk about getting close to failure and pushing ourselves adequately in the gym, the reason why I will say, Hey, you should train a failure on this exercise or that exercise. Usually I'll say on the last set too, because then they'll know (laughs) that they've completely sandbagged that whole exercise and be like, Mm -hmm. damn, I had way more in the tank because they have to know what failure is in order to find a proximity from it. And so usually, um, and it really depends who I'm working with, but um, when we get to a point where maybe we have set all the basics, we are regularly training in the gym already, and we've got that part down, then we'll look at, okay, now are we progressing? If we're not, then we're going to do that. And if we are at the cap of progressing at what they think they're pushing themselves at, okay, let's, let's take some videos of your last set and your first set compare those. Are they very similar or they look completely different because your last set should not look like your first set of anything. Um, and a lot of people don't recognize that at all. So really just digging into that, uh, with, with training can be a big game changer for people when they want to build muscle and lose fat and they don't realize it because they just think, well, I just need to feel the burn. Um, so that's something training to failure. I will actually tell people to do that in many circumstances to make sure they understand what that stimulus is. Yeah. And I definitely, I I like the idea of clients really learning what failure really looks like so they can push themselves a little bit further than maybe they thought they could, which is wonderful. Um, And like you said, in terms of building muscle and things like that, but the other side of the coin is we don't want you training to failure with every single exercise every single day, because that's going to lead to burnout and a lot of soreness. So, um, I think Brett Contreras actually just covered this, um, a little while ago. There's someone on Instagram who's like super famous. I think she's in like Brazil or something. I just saw that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she's this like trainer and she pushes people to the point where like they're crying, like their, their legs are shaking, like literal true failure. Like they can not failure. Yeah. 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 yeah, Beyond failure. Um, and she has like 3 million like Instagram followers or something crazy. And I, again, I think it, it goes to show it's because it's extreme, right? Like it's, it's extreme. So it's getting a lot of eyes and it's generally generating a lot of conversation and things like that. Um, because training, and just like normal training, like doesn't really get a lot of, um, of, uh, eyes on you. But if you trained like that for every single session, for every single lift, every single exercise, like you would be beyond sore and you are going to lose out on additional workouts because of how sore you are. So it doesn't really make sense for you to train like that all the time, because again, you're going to miss out on sessions. So instead of maybe getting four or five sessions a week, you're only getting like one or two. So, you know, when you hear this, like, yeah, absolutely. I think you should learn what your failure is and what your limits are and thinking, oh, I can actually probably push myself a little bit further, but that's not how you should train all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a great example. Cause that's kind of like one of the things that got me thinking about, um, all of this. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I think that goes really well into the types of workouts that, uh, someone enjoys rather than what's optimal. So, um, I, again, I feel like you and I are probably very similar. And I know that we've talked about this before with how you used to train and how you were literally crazy, um, (laughs) is I, you know, I'd want someone working out like four or five, maybe, maybe even six days a week. Um, cause I thought, you know, more was better. And if, you have someone who's only working out one day a week and you want them to train five or six, um, chances are kind of like what you talked about before, if they're not able to do that and they're only getting 
only, I say only, only getting in four workouts a, a week. And they're like, wow, I'm failing at getting six. It's the same thing with protein, right? Like we want to meet them where they're at and say, all right, well, let's start with one or two and see how you're doing with that. And if you want to continue with one or two, that's great. And we'll do that the entire time we're working together. And if you say, Hey, I think I can add in the third. Awesome. We'll add that in too. Or, you know, if someone, uh, I think that sometimes what happens with uh, a lot of our female clients is they will say, Hey, I'm really getting bored with these workouts, or I just don't feel like I'm working hard enough. Um, that is sometimes a fight, not a fight. Um, but that is a, a, I guess a disagreement. And, and sometimes it's like, well, you don't need to be doing burpees in between every single set. Like you do need to rest. And there are times where you may walk out of the gym and not feel like you are drenched in sweat, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you had a bad workout. Um, and so sometimes it, instead of having that conversation, I might add in a couple supersets. Um, I might add in some, you know, different ways that I'm trying to meet them where they're at, but it, so like compromising, but also what I feel like is going to be the most optimal for their progress. Um, I also used to do those bro splits, like back and buys, chest and tries and all that. Um, and now like I will move someone to a uh, full body. Um, and this is something that I had a conversation with, uh, the other day with a client where, they were working out one day a week and they wanted to move to two and they asked if they could move to an upper day and a lower day. Um, and while I love an upper and lower day, I said, Hey, um, I don't think this is going to be the most optimal, optimal for you. And this is why. And I said, let's say, uh, you work out one day a week for the year. So that's 52 weeks. And if you split that up to two workouts, I was like, that's a hundred and what is a hundred four. Um, and I was like, and if you break that up into upper and lower, and let's say you miss a few weeks, you miss a few workouts, uh, whatever it might be. And you only hit, uh, for math purposes, you only hit 30 workouts for upper and lower. So that means for the entire year, you've hit your upper 30 times and you've hit your lower body 30 times. But if you were to do full body and you were still that 30 and 30, well, you've hit your upper and lower 60 times now. So you've doubled your volume. So that is a conversation I had to have with her. And she was like, oh, wow, I never thought of it that way. Thank you. So there are times where I feel like it is our job as coaches to be like, hey, this is why we're doing something. But then if a client wants to do a couple supersets to feel like they're working a little bit harder, I I'm not going to complain and I'll, I'll accommodate them. So it is, again, it's, it's always kind of trying to figure out like where to interject and say, Hey, this is why we're doing the things that the way we are. Uh, but then also trying to accommodate what someone enjoys, because again, if, if a client is not working out at all and they're not following the protocol because they don't enjoy it, well, then it doesn't make sense for us to try to force them to do what's optimal. Yeah. And actually something that, uh, has happened recently with a client, I can't remember who it was, but, um, basically <laughs> what happened was they were put on a full body split and they were like, wow, I don't like this. So we explained, here's why this works, right? Because exactly what you said, higher frequency across the week, uh, less likelihood that you're going to miss a body part, um, all that stuff. And you're able to push harder on each body part each day because mm -hmm. you are not doing as much on each body part each day. And she was like, yeah, but I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and technically full body was most beneficial for her um, with her schedule circumstance, uh, for her to see the best possible results, but we switched away from it because she literally hated it to the point where it was in interfering with her ability to adhere to the plan as a whole. So I would rather take, you know, 75% adherence on a plan someone enjoys versus 40% adherence on a plan that somebody doesn't enjoy. That's optimal, right? So it's always about how do we get the person sticking to the thing? Um, so that's a really good example of that with the full body versus like an upper day, a lower day or all of that. So that plus, you know, when you say types of workouts, you made me think of more so what you said about like supersets and circuits and stuff, you know, we're not, um, we're not CrossFit coaches. We're not, you know, here to sweat our butts off, um, all day. And, you know, really the basis of losing fat and keeping it off is, is strength training and building muscle and our metabolism. Um, but we actually have a client who, uh, I'll be doing a post on her soon, but she actually, um, has had a very successful fat loss phase. And I was looking at her workouts like uh, the other week, cause I'm not her like one-on-one -on -one coach, but, 
uh, basically she has a, a short window in her day because she has a daughter, um, that her daughter is not home from school yet. And she's finished with work that she can get her training in. And it's a very short window and she has a home kind of gym set up and very limited weights. They don't get very heavy. So basically the only way to create as much metabolic stress and <laughs> time under tension that was necessary for her to see any progress from her workouts was to basically do like circuits with reps in like the 30, 40 range, doing consecutive reps for 60 to 90 seconds without even counting, um, like basically all circuit style. So rounds of the exercises back to back and then resting after all of it. And all of that is like super, like if you want to put it in a technical sense, like super against the way we normally program, but it worked for her and it worked for her schedule and her ability to adhere and her ability to get through every workout and to push herself and to get the output that was necessary for her fat loss phase and progress in some way. Because when you have, you know, only 25 pound dumbbells and you're getting stronger than 25 pound dumbbell dumbbells, what do you do when you hit you know, 15 reps and, you know, you're, you're capped, you're not capped. You can do 20, you can do 25, you can do 30. It's going to train a different system. It's not going to train muscular strength as much. It's going to train muscular endurance more, but are you progressing in some way, shape or form? Yes. And is that optimal? No, but did it work for her? And was it optimal for her at that given time in her life? Yes. So that's what you made me think of was that one circumstance, um, because we don't normally program that way, but, um, it's a, a very good example of not evidence-based. Yeah. So I think that this plays in really well to 2020 and what a lot of people went through was, you know, they're used to going to these big commercial gyms and now all of a sudden gyms are shut down and they're having to work out <laughs> with like gallon jugs and, uh, you know, whatever household items they can find. And, uh, there were some people where all they had was bands. They don't have a home gym. So they were having to train in a way that they'd never done before. And some people saw a lot of progress from that, whereas they thought it would be the exact opposite, but you're introducing a new stimulus to your body. And so I, I don't want you to think, Oh, okay. I need to shock my body <laughs> and all these things. Cause that is, you know, that's a very bro science thing to do, but you are introducing a new stimulus and your body hasn't adapted to it yet. So there are really good chances that you're going to make progress from that. So the other thing I was thinking about is moms. <laughs> like, obviously I, I am in that lifestyle right now. Um, and especially when you have a, a younger, um, a younger baby who is, uh, either breastfeeding or has to feed very frequently, um, you have a very, very short window of time before their next feed. So Marissa, fun fact, um, they say, you know, you need to feed every two to three hours. So let's say we start at, uh, noon. Okay. Well that starts the, the time. And so you finish feeding, maybe the feed is an hour long, but oh, it's from God. the it's from the start <laughs> of the feeding. Oh. So it doesn't mean, oh, okay, they ended at one. So therefore it's two hours. No, it's, it's from the start of the feeding. So it would be two is when you would do the next feeding, not three. Jesus. So <laughs> let's say you're like, okay, they're, they're done feeding. So now I have an hour before I have to feed again. So I have to get in a workout and then maybe they go down for a nap and you get in 20 minutes and they wake up and you have to go, you know, cause they can't be away from you. So you have to go and and tend to them. So for you, you might think, Oh, I only got in 20 minutes of my workout. Like that sucks or whatever it might be. Um, for some moms, this may not be again, what research shows is the most optimal way to train is let's say, okay, you feed or whatever you go up throughout your day. And then maybe, you know, someone comes home and you're able to go back and, and do part of your workout. Maybe you just do two more exercises. And then you come back and you do whatever you need to do. If you need to feed, you know, be with the baby. And then later on in the day, you get two more exercises in. Uh, some people may hate this because I know some people just like to go to the gym, get it over with and go back their day. Um, but some people who really enjoy training, this is a really good way, just breaking up your lifts throughout the day. And you might find again, that you make a lot of progress this way. Cause you're not as tired. You're not as sore. You're not as exhausted going into your next, uh, going to your, like the next part of your lift, but you are allowed to do that, <laughs> especially yeah. if that allows you to complete your workouts. 
Yeah. Yeah. In uh, the whole COVID time when everybody was like working from home and, uh, you know, doing jumping jacks in their living room or whatever. Um, but for a couple clients, I came up with what's called exercise snacks, um, which is literally just like, you know, bite size workouts in mm -hmm. the, in your day. So like if you're working from home and you're really struggling to adapt to it, cause you feel glued to your laptop. Okay. How can we get you up for like 15 minutes, do a little something, and then, you know, spread that across the day. Is it optimal? No, because we want, um, the maximum amount of muscular tension and stress, stress all at once in a session. And that, that is optimal according to the research, but you know, if you get the same amount of volume in across the day, uh, you know, you're not going to be busting a sweat, you know, by the end of those 10 minutes every time, but you will have accumulated the same amount of volume at the end of the day. And it's better than nothing, right. It's better than just yep. skipping it. So absolutely love that. Um, the next one I'm going to kind of lump in two together because they're basically the same thing, uh, to save time. Uh, but basically, you know, we've talked about our, our pyramid, whether it's Eric Helms, uh, strength and, um, shit, what's it called? The muscle and strength pyramids <laughs> or oh, the poor Eric. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, thank God. He probably doesn't listen to this on his free time, but, um, <laughs> basically his muscle and strength pyramids or, uh, the pyramid that like we use at PCC, which is roughly the same, but like habits, um, nutrient dense foods, macros, and then our 1% details, either way, those, uh, 1% details like meal timing supplements, um, ex very, very specifics of things, uh, are at the top of the pyramid. Meaning that like, just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like you only get there when you got the rest of the foundation built. Um, and so what we aim to do with our clients, Christina and I both is focus on the foundation first and then build up to those details if they're needed. But, and, and that is supported by evidence because that's truly what's sustainable for, for people is just living a healthier lifestyle. Like you don't freaking need intermittent fasting. There's tons of research on it, but like <laughs> not great research. Um, and we've seen how that doesn't play out well in actual life. Um, and that's one situation where I will say this fad diets, keto, intermittent fasting, all these things, um, there is research on them to show that they're effective, but there's also research out there that basically says anything that you want it to say. If you Google it, it will, it will be there. There is a study on a lot. Um, but when it comes to actually putting some of these fads or trends into practice, like keto, like intermittent fasting, what we find is just that they're not sustainable. So even though the research says that they work, are they best for you? Are they actually practical for your life? Probably not. So take that obviously with a grain of salt with everything, but, um, the top of the pyramid supplements, meal timing. Sometimes I will take something like that. And I haven't done this with supplements in a while, but like meal timing is one where I might help a client build out an actual meal schedule that they need to follow in order to promote consistency on things like the bottom of the pyramid, which is eating regularly across the day, um, having well-rounded meals, um, you know, being able to choose nutrient dense foods, all of that. Sometimes if they have that guidance, but they don't know when they should eat or how often they feel a little lost, or they just need something to get them excited because like intermittent fasting sounds cool. <laughs> Keto whole 30, all the fun rules that come along with that, that like make it so clear. And so black and white provides people clarity, provides people, um, with excitement of like, I'm starting this thing rather than just like, oh, I'm making one small tweak to my day. Some people love that, but some people really love the idea of starting something, right? And so sometimes I will use elements of that to be like, hey, here's your meal template. Here's your you know, meal schedule. Here's the supplement that you should take with this meal, this meal, and this meal so that we are promoting consistency on the bottom of that pyramid. And so I will be very clear with people and say, Hey, <laughs> this, what I'm, what I'm asking you to do is not, you know, that fad or that thing. Um, but I'm using this and I will literally tell them the like reverse psychology behind it. I will literally tell them I'm using this to promote adherence on what's important. Um, but they still are like, Oh my God, I'm so stoked. <laughs> so they'll go ahead and do it better than if they had just felt maybe apathetic or lost or confused with some of the more basic low hanging fruit type of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, and it's funny. Cause I think this, even though I know that like, uh, fat burners and, and thermos like aren't the make or break for a fat loss. I love taking a thermo <clears throat> right before cardio in the morning. Yeah. I Ab- like absolutely love it. Right? Yeah. Absolutely love it. And it, I think part of it, it's just the routine. I like feeling, even if it's a placebo effect, and I know it could possibly be a placebo effect. I love implementing those things before sessions. I get excited. Um, even if I'm like going on a, a walk, like taking a thermo, just like, I don't know. I just feel like oh, fast cardio. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like, even though, again, like a lot of research shows that like fasted cardio isn't necessarily better than fed cardio. It's just something that I really enjoy doing. Um, and also coming from a standpoint with like a behavioral thing. uh, And I talk about this all the time. I loved in prep, like the structure, the waking up, the feeling like I'm grinding and the discipline of getting up. And the first thing I do is cardio. Like it's hard. I'm knocking it out of the way and I feel so much better the rest of the day. So even though research shows, there's really no difference. I like how I feel and I feel like I perform better and my choices throughout the day are better. Um, so I prefer doing fast cardio with a thermo. Yeah. Yeah. So that just added on another one was fast cardio is a great one that I didn't even think about. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a great one. But yeah, it, especially, you know, behaviorally, if it gets you going um, and, you know, that goes for a lot of like those morning routine type things, like you don't need a morning routine. Like there's not like tons and tons of research. I don't think at least showing that like you need to do a cold plunge first thing in the morning mm-hmm. and then journal for 10 minutes and then pray for 80 like hours. And <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, your day is perfect and you've accomplished everything. So I don't, I don't think that there really is much pointing to that. Um, more on the individual side, like there is research to show that cold plunging and cold showers and, and dips are actually beneficial for certain things. But, um, in terms of like starting your day and being productive and making better choices, like you have to figure out what your keystone habit is. And this is something that basically your keystone habit is the, the, the trigger that like basically domino affects the rest of your day in a good way. Um, that might be waking up and doing fast cardio. Like it may very well be for you, but for an- another person, it may be uh, waking up and taking the cold shower, uh, which I still do, by the way, Mm -hmm. still do. Um, or it might be waking up and sitting in the sun for five minutes, uh, Mm -hmm. or journaling or just drinking water or whatever it is. It can be super simple. One friend of mine, I've told this story before it was having a multivitamin. It was so, so weird, (laughs) but that was her thing. Um, and so, you know, you, There is really not a lot to say that you have to have a certain routine. You don't have to start your day any certain way. And it definitely doesn't have to be cardio, but to your point, uh, whatever is going to perpetuate the best adherence and habits across the rest of your day, across the rest of your week Mm -hmm. is so, so important when you think about actually reaching the goal, because you have to be consistent to get there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you wrote meal plan templates and I don't know what you mean by that. So, yeah, I mean, I kind of covered it with the like meal timing and supplements, like, okay, I, I, like I'll kind of like at times, and we've actually created a whole like framework for this for clients. Like we've actually put together a meal plan template where it's like, maybe somebody just really doesn't want to track macros and they need a way to make sure they're eating enough across the day. And so we will actually, and maybe they need variety in their diets. We built out this whole drop down menu thing of like, if you're going to eat three meals a day, here's a bunch of op- options and here's how many servings you could have. And this could literally be built out as like, you could call it a quote unquote meal plan, but it's really just the client building out their own set of structure for themselves. Um, and are meal plans evidence-based? No. Um, do I think that you should follow that into perpetuity? No, but it's going to give you ideas, structure, and a framework for what the basic habits are that you need. And that's what's important from that. And so when it comes to these non-evidence-based ways that we coach in general, I think the biggest thing is just like very, very, very clear communication of like, Hey, this is why we're doing it. This is like not in line with X, Y, and Z because of this. And we're still doing it because I believe it's going to foster this behavior or this result. And I want you to make sure that you are very clear on the fact that it is not a magic solution or, you know, a quick fix or anything like that. And I'm utilizing this in this way. So I think that's 
what's really key with something, you know, as trivial as a quote unquote meal plan, um, in order to, um, make sure that, you know, your, your clients or you, if you're listening to this and you're like, wow, these are great ideas. Um, make sure you're clear on when you start anything like that. Um, so the last thing that we have to cover is intuitive eating and not hitting targets. So I'm going to take a crack at what I think you mean. Um, <laughs> okay. but I had a client who, um, has struggled with macro tracking. She came from contest prep and really struggled. Uh, and I, again, she didn't have an eating disorder, but had definitely had disordered eating, uh, habits around macro tracking. So she had a lot of anxiety when it came to it. Um, she was really struggling even when we reduced her like, Hey, let's just focus on protein. Um, she did a lot better on that. Um, and she was like, I feel a lot more, uh, relaxed when it comes to my food choices. Um, uh, I feel like I trust my instincts and like, yeah, maybe she goes over fat some days, maybe she goes over carbs some days. Um, but she felt like that was a really great approach for her, even though it's not optimal because we don't necessarily know with accuracy what she's eating day to day or week to week. But for her, she saw a lot of progress. Um, and I think a lot of that was because we were reducing her stress when it came to macro tracking. And that was one less thing she had to think about because she had a lot of stuff going on. So is it ideal? No, I would love to know every single day what a client is eating because it's easier, right? It makes our job as coaches easier because we can adjust your macros. We can be very specific. We can figure out what is affecting you. But for her, it was just, it just came down to reducing stress. And you could literally see the fat and like inflammation just melt off of her week by week, just by reducing that additional stressor. So again, it's, it's based on, uh, what we see with intuitive eating. Not a lot of people are able to do that because they underestimate what they eat and they overestimate their, um, their output, uh, as far as activity levels. So for, for a lot of people, that is a very, very difficult skill to transition to, and maybe it, it, was something that she could do because she had that experience with macro tracking. So maybe that was part of it. Um, but for her, we just did protein only. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, it's pretty close. There's kind of two directions that I was going to take it. And that's one of them was like, um, with intuitive eating, it's not really wonderfully supported by the research. Um, because what the frick is even intuitive eating it's just people <laughs> eat, like literally you pull a person off the street and you're like, Hey, what are you eating today? And they're like, I don't know, whatever I feel like eating that's intuitive <laughs> eating. Yeah. That's literally what it is. But when we talk about maybe mindful eating structure strategy, um, having, uh, having structure and good choices in your diet without tracking your food, uh, not optimal. And, I'm not to say like tracking your macros is necessarily research based in the sense that like research has said like this is the best way to lose weight. Right. Right. But, um, it's not qu as quantifiable and we will actually have clients who will attempt fat loss without measuring and without weighing in that sense, but they might use hand portion sizes. They might have certain guidelines for listening to their hunger cues and, um, staying within a certain range of, I'm a little hungry and I'm not getting super full. So that is my quote unquote deficit. It will work if somebody can stick to it. And for the person that has such a damaged relationship with food and such a damaged relationship with say food scales and tracking and macros and my fitness pal, it's a unique circumstance where we might say, Hey, we're going to have you use this. And, you know, like you said, from the reduction in stress, <laughs> they're like, Oh my God. I can eat this and I just eat till I'm full and I feel good. And they're able to see results from that because they're not like self-sabotaging and binging because they were a failure because they didn't hit their macros to the gram. Yep. So not evidence-based and definitely not quantifiable and not ideal for coaches because we're like, I don't know what the frick you're eating. That stresses me out because then I'm like, yeah. I don't know how to guide you. Um, so it is for a very particular person, but that's, that's definitely one way that we could utilize that. And then, um, when I said like not hitting your targets, um, in particular, this made me think of a conversation we had with a client very recently, which was basically just the question. Oh, it was today. Actually it was, <laughs> I'm, I'm using the hunger scale. I'm not, uh, I'm not hungry. And it's the end of the day. 
but I have not hit my protein target of four servings today. What do I do? Do I force feed it or do I leave Mm -hmm. it? That's a really and, difficult conversation. Yeah, it is a very nuanced conversation. And ultimately um, the answer was, it comes down to what is your priority in your goals right now? Is it fat loss or muscle gain? And like actively working towards a desired result, then you should get the protein in and you should try to, and here's where, you know, it can get kind of um, nuanced is this might only be a problem because we're not spacing our meals appropriately throughout the day. Um if that's not the case and they're still just not hungry and maybe they have some issues with appetite signaling, but that is the goal. Maybe their metabolism and appetite is suppressed because they've been dieting. Maybe that's a reason why they're not feeling hungry. They should still get the protein in. But the flip side is this is definitely not evidence-based, but if you are maintaining your progress after the diet, and you have no, you know, specific end goal in sight, and you have that same question, I'd probably say, just leave it. Like, just listen to your body and get more in tune with continuing to listen to your body. Again, check if it's a meal spacing issue, but if it's not, (laughs) then probably uh, just listen to your body so that you're not just force, like creating a habit of force feeding calories for no reason, because that's what's going to cause you to not maintain your shit long-term, right? So yeah, I would say that's not evidence based because then you're under on your protein targets and, uh, you know, it also matters how often is this happening, <laughs> but, um, you know, if it's a one-off thing here and there, I would say definitely like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be that person who says you have to get your protein in or you'll die. Um, <laughs> I, I think I have been that coach in the past and that was because of the evidence that I would be that way. So kind of finding my way a- away from that has been, has been good. Yeah. Um, so if you've made it all the way to the end of this episode, I feel like, you know, you have a, a better grasp on things when it comes to health and fitness. And my favorite thing to say, of course, is like, all of it depends, right? Like figuring out what's best for you, what's going to work best for you, even if it's not optimal. Um, and you know, God, there are so many different things that we could dive into, like, what's the best time to work out, you know, uh, there are studies that show it's, it's this, but like, if you can only get it in during a certain time of day, like that's the most optimal for you, that's, you know, do what works best. So, um, I guess out of all of this, we could sum it up in a couple sentences is just figure out what's going to work best for you, what you feel like you're going to be able to adhere to and what you feel like you're going to be able to stick to for a long period of time. Now, does that mean that you won't have to push or get a little uncomfortable if you have very specific goals? No, you might need to, um, like Marissa saying, like if you, um, want to put on a lot of muscle, but you're not eating very much, you might have to kind of force feed at times and go, uh, beyond the hunger and fullness. Or if you are starving, but you want to diet, well, you know, there are different strategies that we can implement, but you might have to deal with hunger for a little bit. So, um, a lot of different things, um, and a lot of, different, you know, if you're reading a research study to don't think that, oh my God, I need to rearrange everything. This is like, this blows my mind. Like I've been doing everything wrong. Like if what you're doing is working, then stick with it. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So are we, are we going to get this under an hour? Oh my God, we are. Yes. So, <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this as much as we did. I think this was a really, really fun episode, um, but we hope that you enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. You can find both of us on Instagram. You can find me at Christy Lynn Fit and Marissa is at Marissa Roy Fitness. Thank you so much for listening and we hope to see you back next week.